first person I'd like to recognize tonight that put all this together for me is Paul Trainer, who's the oh. technician oh. here to make sure all the electronics work and everything. And he's had a project for several years where he goes out and videos the planes that are out here for the museum and gets a crew member that flew on that plane and does a walk around and talk about that plane. And he and I, we did the C-141, which is then in the gift shop for sale for moneymaker for the museum. And uh, he's put all this together and it works real well for me. I just got a bunch of slides together and emailed them to him and he put them on there. So we'll see him tonight. The uh, history then of how I got into 124s, like we're talking about the 100th anniversary of the base next year, the reserve history started in 1960 when the unit was out at Long Beach. They moved here to March. Before that was a full sack base. But then the reserves got here with 50 planes, a C-119 flying boxcar. It was here till about 67, and then they retired that and brought the C-124 in, and the reserves flew those for till 1971 through that, and then they took all those to Davis Monthan and scrapped them. So the only ones that are left are the few in museums. And they didn't leave one here for the museum in March, which was too bad. It was a big plane, so we. Reserves have been here, and then in 1995 or so is when they had the base closures. So since then, it's been an all-reserve base here. So the history will probably go on into the future that way in quite a while. So when we got the C-124s, I had to go to uh, just the ground training, which was at a air guard base in Tennessee when I up to do my two weeks and then we had the flight some uh, flight instructors here so we got the instruction right here at March to fly them so we went from having flying box cars where we only flew around the United States and up to Alaska we had the 124 we had the capability of flying across the Pacific and of course getting it in 67 that's when the big buildup was starting Vietnam, so had missions to fly in. The reserves flew the plane. You, the reserves had to, there are our own planes, and a crew would get together. They would sign up when you could go somewhere from your job. Like I say, I was at UCR, so I would come out for 10 days or two weeks and fly a mission somewhere out in the Pacific. We'll get to that. So th this is a model of the 124. You can see it had a low wing, four engines, and a big fuselage. You can see, I don't know, if probably not that well, but there's a bunch of windows at two levels. So it actually was a double decker inside. The top deck could be moved, the floor could be put up the side and they could have a high cargo come in, or they could lower the sides and put normally 200 troops, but if they lowered the second deck, they could carry 400 people in the plane. We uh, had it here at the reserves. We were just flying strictly cargo. You could fly 50,000 pounds of cargo in this plane. Uh, depending on how far you had to go, you would have to subtract cargo for fuel. But, so most missions went out with about 30,000 pounds. But the, what was it pressurized? No, no, no pressurized. You flew out over the Pacific about eight or 10,000 feet. So it, <clears throat> no pressure. And so you, you flew along, they called it old shaky because you were flying in where the most turbulence is in clouds or if there's buildups, and you just sat there for 10 hours, 12 hours, just bouncing around. That was his name, Old Shaky. 
And what I have with Paul, like I say, we got the slides and then we found a couple of videos where they show the 124 actually flying. And the plane had big doors in the front, clamshell, that would open right up and the ramps and they could drive a Greyhound bus inside. Strictly, they kept it flying until the C-5, which is the four-engine jet, became operational. And it took quite a, several years. They had a lot of problems with hydraulics on it, so the 124 kept hauling until the C-5 could do it. And then the 141 recently was replaced by the C-17s, which are out on the runway. And they have a capability of a good-sized car. Did it have air-to-air -air refueling? No, no. This was before those days. The C-141 that I, that I flew in didn't have refueling, but in the mid-70s, they came out with uh, air refueling. They could refuel them. So I, what I have is I just selected some pictures of showing the plane sitting on the ramp. One of the things the 134 feet long and 170 wingspan, and the tail was 50 feet in the air. The top was 48 and something. But the, the big thing to get used to was the cockpit was over 25 feet in the air. And then when you come in to land, you get a nose high attitude, so you're up there even higher. So you had to learn to not look down, but you're looking way out the end of the runway. To Perspective. So we're coming in and landed. With all that weight and everything, you see it was just uh, really four wheels. You look at the C5 or the 141, they had a whole bunch of wheels under them. This is what the dimensions I was giving you what on the plane. You see there's a door here in the plane. And if they had a <clears throat> using the plane for troop drop, this is where the paratroopers would exit the plane then. It was right through. There's a door on the other side and this one. And then we, we'll see some slides later, but this is the front entrance, and then there was also a hydraulic system in the plane with a hoist that ran from one end to the other, and there was a, like bomb bay doors right in the midsection that would open up, and you could use the hoist to bring the cargo in and out of the plane. So there's three different exits. Here shows the Front section, the pilot and co-pilot, the front engineer sat behind, but there was a wall there with a door but going in. But the flight engineer sat behind the co-pilot, the navigator sat behind the pilot. To get up into the cockpit, see there's a ladder. You had to climb to get up in there. And then it's showing here, we were talking about it just a little bit ago, there was an entrance into the wing. So the flight engineer, if there was a problem in flight, they could go all the way out. Here shows one here. Out to the engine, and like if you had a generator go out or burn up, you could go out, remove the generator, and uh, the engine was still good. Or the flight engineer even had a panel where they could analyze the engine. The, the, I'd bring out the, the engines were what they called a 4360. It was a 28-cylinder engine. There was four rows of cylinders and seven cylinders in the row. And each one had two spark plugs. So you got 56 spark plugs. But if you happen to have some bad luck that a whole bunch of them went bad, they could actually theoretically go, I don't know, I never was on a plane where they did it, but 
where he could go out and access it in flight. Now this wasn't pressurized, so we weren't flying at an altitude that that it would have been a factor. And the only factor would have been maybe it's cold. And uh, it just, the cargo compartment, it shows somebody walking in this right here is that opening where the hoist above could bring cargo up and down. This is a, a view of the cockpit showing the pilot. And co-pilot, and we'll get into that. The throttles, the yoke, the, the throttles, the flight engineer ran the, the engines really so that the pilot only touched the throttles for takeoff and as soon as you got above the ground, he'd hand them over to the flight engineer and coming in to land, the flight engineer would have the throttles right till he was on final approach and then the pilot would take over. There was a lot of space up there compared to a lot of planes or like you see airliners if you ever fly and look up in the cockpit. You could stand up in here. And then here's the flight engineer's panel. And it, you know, it looks like a lot of instruments, but see so you got four engines. So every instrument is four times. And this is their analyzer here, engine analyzer. And this is the curtains drawn, but he's got a side window. He can look out. He can at least see the right side of the plane. It just shows the fuel tanks on one side. It had six tanks on each side. And when they refueled, they had a center point refueling so that the flight engineer would sit at the panel and they would have another engineer outside and the they would talk to each other and the one up the panel then would do the pushing the wrong button. Fill the tanks one at a time, but he could handle everything from the panel about where the fuel was going from the center point. And this is the navigator station here and he had a radar screen he could look at. And the radar was only used mainly in weather. The radar, they, uh, you get out there in the Pacific and run into some big storms and you try to guide your way through between different cells. Pretty soon it's like driving a mountain pass. You come to a dead end and then you got to go through one. Because again, we couldn't go much over 10,000 feet, so you, jets now, they can fly above them. In the rear of the plane, they had a comfort station and a couple of bunks and stuff. Especially the reserves go out with double crew members, because it was also a training thing besides hauling cargo. And so there was a stove back here, and bunks where he could lay down for a while. Was there a toilet? Yes. Here it shows this this person's up at the second level and the, he's got the floor folded up. So if they wanted high cargo or else he'd drop the floor and they would have a second level. Then. Here it shows the front of the plane then that where the ramps come down and they just drive onto the plane with Another picture shows the size you can put on of cargo. Here it shows the heating and duct system. When you're flying a big plane like that, and it's huge, and it's like a barn door out here, pretty near. you get into icing or something, it build up in a hurry. So there was a heating system in here and then in the wing, I haven't pointed that out, but when you see the plane flying or like this one, this is 
on the tips of the wing. These are not jet engines, which a lot of people think it is, but they're huge heaters so that the air comes in and the air then goes through the wing, keeps the frost and ice off of the wing. It shows right here coming in from the heater on the wing, goes out into the wing. There's a shot, the only shot that somebody took of me sitting in the seat. So I, the only proof I have that I was in one. <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> There's another shot that show the difference. The C-119 is what's sitting out here on the ramp. And here's the <clears throat> 124 with a car going up in it. I might add, at that point right here, this is the same engine as on the 124, 4360 with the 28 cylinders. One of the places then, once it opened up to fly west, the 124 flew about 200 miles an hour. That's about the speed, so they like to go to Hawaii, 2400 miles, it took 10, 12 hours to get there. If people flew airliners back in the 50 when they were propeller driven, that's what it took to go across the United States. It was 10 or 12 hours rather than the five or six now. So it was quite a lot of time. And Wake Island sits west of Hawaii, 2,000 miles. So it's another 10 hours to get to Wake Island. And Wake Island is unique. It's the only island within about 1,000 miles out closest one. And it's the top of a mountain, 10,000 foot mountain. In other words, the water's 10,000 feet deep there. And at the top of the mountain, it's just right below water level. So the coral has been built up on that over the years. So all this is, is a coral reef. And the runway runs down one side and then the planes are parked in here, and they had some quarters over here for the cruise. So you spent the night there, and then the next day you get up and fly to the Philippines or Guam or Japan, which was another eight or ten hours. So when you C-124, you go out into the Pacific, deliver cargo, and fly back. You generally had 80 or 90 flying hours, about 10, 12 days. at the end of the slides, I guess. Yeah. So you can show that first video now. But Paul, like I said, he made these videos out here we did. And, and these are, one of them is similar in that they show your way around the plane. By the way, it's Globemaster 2. Globemaster 1 was a C. 74 during the 40s, and then this came out in the 49. And the Goldmaster 3 is the one on the other side of the runway. The C 17 is called the Goldmaster 3. The home of Army Ordnance, and also the home of the Travis Air Force Base, Force Base Historical Society C 124 Goldmaster, known as Old Shaky. Here's some of the uh, B-29s that are still in the field. There's there's Woody's uh, first airplane. Oh, <laughs> the crew uh, walking around this morning in the cool, brisk weather here in Maryland, thinking about what we're going to do with the airplane. There goes our friendly instrument man. Here's the C-124 sitting out in the backside of the airfield. Earlier they were over in the uh, old aircraft area that we saw before. This will give you an idea of what the aircraft sort of looked like when we picked it up a year ago and had it towed over in this area. 
go take a tour of the airplane in just a, a bit here. There it sits in all its splendor, all shaky. This aircraft has not flown in approximately 10 years. It was flown in here, and uh, the maintenance crew has put the aircraft back together. Every system has been thoroughly inspected, rebuilt. The uh, aircraft was to be cranked up and taxied prior to flight. Uh, the flight crew will pull a flight check on it and make sure all systems are go prior to flying. As you can see, it looks in pretty good shape here. This will be the only flying C-124 in the world. There are only about eight other aircraft such as this type around the world left today of approximately 380 that were built in the 50s. Here's some of the engines. You can see the pretty bad shape that they're in. Bent pop blades. A lot of the stacks are missing. Antennas are broken. Parts missing. Ladder is broken. I want to emphasize the maintenance crew that worked on these aircraft. Mainly were from Dobbins, Georgia, the Air National Guard there. And the rest of the people were from Travis Air Force Base, which compromised active duty people, some Air National Guard people from California, and Air Force Reserve people from California, a few people from Dover, and a couple other bases around. Mostly all C-124 people who worked on 124s were in an active service many years ago. View from the top hatch of the aircraft back along the fuselage out on the wings. Old engines that come off our aircraft, and we got here and started checking the engines, we found out that all the engines have been frozen due to weather and rain running down the cylinders. So now the engines were, uh, these uh, engines come off the aircraft uh, we're in pretty bad shape. We ended up going to Tucson, Arizona to an engine dealer that had bought uh, many engines off the 124s. In fact, he has about 300 of them down there, Granic engines. And we ended up buying five engines from him for the aircraft, which the uh, maintenance crew went ahead and changed all the engines out on the aircraft. We have all good engines now. We've run them up and they all checked out good. These engines here are literally junk. They'll be sent back to the salvage dealer and he'll hopefully buy them back for salvage only. Here we have our project engineer, Dave Floyd. <laughs> Morning, Dave. Hi, Larry. Oh. All right, get set. Oh. Key, bird, Six. What a motley looking crew. Okay. What? Motley. You guys look like you had a bad evening. Not us. Huh? We were in bed early. There's a Thunderbelly seat. That looks pretty good today. <laughs> we had a back for this seat. Yeah, I, put put everything I put the only two I could find for this. We don't need them anyway. Well, well, maybe, I thought maybe the engineer had it. What? A letdown monkey. You, you been here in your toll baddie?
You're going to be proud, David. <laughs> Immensely. Huh? If we had to count all the things that we uh -huh. big barters stole, stole from those guys, we'd really be in debt. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Walk around. Oh, it is. Yeah, this is. Yeah. Is it the walk around? Yeah. That one sitting over here is a C-133, which did have the turbo problem. 
four turboprop engines. The Air Force's long-range airlifter that performed yeoman service through two wars, two wars and nearly 25 years, the C-124, nicknamed Old Shaky, was a major redesign of the C-74 Globemaster that was developed at the end of World War II. The C-124 used the same wings and tail and engines as the C-74. It was capable of handling such bulky cargo as tanks, field guns, bulldozers, and trucks, up to 74,000 pounds of cargo. It could also be converted into a transport capable of carrying 200 fully equipped troops in its double-deck cabin or 123 litter patients and their attendants. Okay, well up here the pilot and the co-pilot each had throttles. Uh, the only time they really used them was on the ground for taxing and they would start them up for takeoff and they would control them on landing to, and they had a as far as the they had a prop control they had a mixture control but all of that went through the flight engineer station and it's rare if ever that they would use it uh, over here on this side are the pilots flight instruments on the other side the co-pilot has an identical set over there. They're completely independent so that you have redundancy in case any one should fail the other system would still be operational. Over here is your control for bringing up the landing gear. The co-pilot would bring it up on the pilot's command once he had his uh, rate of climb established after takeoff. Over here on the left is a radar screen. This was used for weather. The very early models, A models, like this one, when it came out of the factory, they didn't have it at that time, but it was later put into the aircraft. And the steering wheel over here, this is for your ground steering, that control the, the, the nose gear for steering on the ground. And over here on the far left, there's a couple of levers, which was for emergency, they were air brakes, in case of hydraulic system failure you still had a backup system for brakes to get you stopped and on um, landing after you landed the pilot would pull his back and then he could take them and pull them way back and go into reverse and uh, then you could use the engine and props for braking action help slow you down these are all uh, radio and navigation instruments trim tab for the rudder trim tab for the elevators well on the flight engineer station here most of the systems except for the flight instruments and the navigation instruments went through the flight engineers panel we had all these one for each engine so there's 48 engine instruments here on the flight engineers panel. Monitor everything that goes on on them. From the flight engineers station, you start engines, do the engine run up, and once they started down the runway, the pilot would he'd start the throttles up, and then he'd call for takeoff or for max power, and you'd follow him up and maintain max power till you got airborne. As soon as he called, got the uh, Gear coming up, he'd call for Mato, and you'd bring back the, pot, the, the props. This was your uh, main prop control here. And uh, the throttle, nexters. Okay. The, uh, and the mixtures. Once you got in cruise uh, on long range flights, you manually leaned out the engines to get maximum uh, fuel economy out of them. Over here you had your carburetor heat to if you was in icing conditions or you could get carburetor icing you, you use carburetor heat to make sure that you didn't get car, uh, carburetor icing. Uh, the fuel, these were for controlling the fuel tanks. This, this was a six tanker. If you happen to have a C model that was a 12 tanker and they had electric uh, control of the, of the uh, fuel there for booster pumps and the, the uh, various valves to route the fuel to the engines. This is the nav navigator position on the C-124. Uh, this is our LORAN, long-range navigation. 
and we have a, a radar, basically a, a, a weather radar primarily, and there's a repeater up in the uh, pilot's position in the front. This is our radar altimeter, and uh, up here is the sextant mount for celestial navigation. There were three main ways of getting, this is primarily a cargo aircraft, and there were three main ways of getting cargo into the aircraft. Through troop doors and stairs on each side, through this elevator platform, and we would have a winch up above with cables to all four corners of this elevator platform. We would open underneath, just like a Bombay door, and lower that to the ground, and you'd have to manually load the boxes and you'd bring that back into the aircraft and you could slide it forward along the rail so you wouldn't have to carry the, the cargo as far. The third way of getting cargo into the aircraft is through the nose. The nose doors would open, they're called clamshell doors, and the two ramps that you see there were extended down and you could drive vehicles into the aircraft. The numbers you see along the side are the number of inches from the nose of the aircraft. And the purpose of those is so you could balance the aircraft. And you couldn't put too much weight in the front or into the, the rear, you had to balance it. And just like a, a passenger with a seat assignment, all the cargo that came in also had an assigned place. There are some photos over here of the aircraft uh, in its restoration process. One of them shows the ramps down with the vehicle being driven off, and here is one of the of a helicopter being uh, winched off the, the, uh, through the nose doors. This aircraft came from Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. In order to get it into Dover, we had to take off the, the engines, the wings, the tail, the gear, and then we had to actually slice the fuselage in half and it just barely fit in, inside a C-5. And then we flowed it, flew it in here, and then we had to reassemble it and, and put all the rivets back in to, to hold it back. What you see here is the upper decking, and this is an example of how it looked when you, when you put it down. We didn't put cargo up there. We had, it wasn't uh, stressed for the, to take the uh, weight of the cargo. But we would have four rows of seats in the cargo main cabin, and then we would have four rows of seats on the upper decking. And with that arrangement, we could carry approximately 400 people in here. Now, you could trade off the seating for litter. So if you wanted to have litter patients, you would just replace the, the seating with litters. Uh, this is the ladder here that uh, is used to get up onto the upper decking. This aircraft is somewhat unique in virtue of the fact that you had tunnels that went out to the, through the wings so that you could access the inboard and outboard engines while in flight. You would go down through this compartment and then there's the tunnel that extends through, through the wing. The primary purpose, or not maybe the primary, but at least one of the main purposes of doing that is that each engine had a generator. And just like an automobile, the generator would sometimes fail, overheat. So if that happened, you had to shut the engine down. But the engine was still good. Then you would have somebody go through the tunnels, and you'd have them physically take the generator off the engine, dis disconnect it, and then you could restart the engine, you could have the power of the engine again. And then the other three generators could supply your electrical power as, as, without any kind of a problem. Well, that's it. So, we've seen the inside, how it flew, and like I say, you've seen the last flight of the 124 on that video. Some, and uh, those uh, slides that I had, I showed the inside of the plane. This is what the, every pilot, or every crew member actually, had one of these. And it's like your operating manual you have for your car. 
tells the plane, and, and I, the slides that I had up there were right out of the book. Eric explains everything in it, operating procedures, and, and so on. And, uh, and then the flight engineers were flying. They had a book that has all kinds of charts in it, depending on your altitude, and if you lose an engine, or something of what power settings to use, and what's the most efficient altitude to be at, you know, depending on your weight and everything. And so it's just a book of charts that they go to to determine what power settings they use at the various altitudes. And as they use up fuel, they change the settings and so on. I was, uh, one of my first talks I gave here was about the Russian flight that came over the North Pole back in 1937 and they landed here, actually over in San Jacinto. They chose not to land here at March Field, but they wanted more room to land. It was a huge wing and uh, like a glider almost, so they needed they had taken the brakes off everything they could to reduce weight. So anyhow, they landed in San Jacinto, but I have the pilot's diary or his logs and stuff, and they talked about that they spent two years before the flight figuring out what the best altitudes and everything. These books I'm showing you are made now that they have them, but they didn't have those charts then, so they had to figure it all out for themselves of what they were going to do. And this particular flight was in the air for 62 hours, non nonstop. They didn't get refueled or anything, and uh, I don't think anything's done that since. They uh, was only flying about 100 miles an hour, so they flew 6,300 miles down Moscow. They picked a 120 degree meridian and flew the meridian right down straight to Los Angeles, set a world record uh, distance mark, plus flying over the North Pole. And, uh, they were just saying, these books show all these charts. These guys had to do their own, figure it out what they were going to do, just like the Wright brothers were figuring out everything. Did they then fly back to Russia? No, they disassembled the plane and shipped it back. That's a good question I have for myself. Why didn't they fly back? They didn't have to go nonstop going back. And maybe the prevailing winds. I say they didn't have to. They, they had it planned even before they landed. They had an engineer in Los Angeles that came right out wherever the plane landed and disassembled it, shipped it back, got it back to Russia and put it in the museum. And then the museum got bombed in World War II and burned it out. Well, you know, even, even uh, well, Lindbergh had to do the same kind of planning. Yeah. For his flight. Sure. <laughs> but these guys threw in the extra thing. They were flying over the pole. Nobody had ever done it, so they didn't even know what the temperatures or the icing conditions and everything would be. What, what was their altitude? Well, again, they were not pressured. So generally, around eight, ten thousand. 10,000, although they had to go up to, I think, the maximum, they went 13 to avoid some I see. So. I hate giving my age away, but I was five <laughs> years old and I lived on the ranch right next to where that landed. And my dad gathered us up yeah. and we went right over there and um, uh, before there was a crowd, you know, just yeah. to, the guys were coming out and, um, and I had understood that it landed because it got lost, but maybe oh. that was not true. They weren't okay. lost, they were just okay. looking. So then they had the 50th anniversary of it, and they yeah. donated a prop to the museum in San Jacinto, and those of us that were kids yeah. that saw it, we well, signed the... See, you missed out, because we found the celebration of the 70th, and then this summer we had the 80th. Yeah. And I have a model of the plane, you know, the one in here, but I've got one that's one-seventh scale, so it's got a wingspan of 17 feet. It's big, and we had it out there at the site where they landed. It's still an empty field if you've been over there recently. And everybody that saw the plane, just like you say, we're five, they signed the wing. 
that they saw the plane on the ground. And uh, 10 years ago, we had 30 people. But you weren't. I didn't hear about it. Oh, well. Until afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And then this I summer, this summer we did again. There was about 10 showed up. That's one of the remaining ones. Yeah. Yeah, then. <laughs> We got a couple minutes. I, yeah, we got a good picture of it sitting there. How is this what, when you lose an engine? How is it to handle when you lose an engine? That's just what I was going to, I got a story to tell long as I got to spend five minutes here. Yeah, it handled real good. It, no problem. And see, by the time the reserve got these planes, they had quite a few hours on them. They, when they finally got rid of them, they were around 20,000 hours. Had, but the engines were a big problem. They, when they had them in the B-36s, they, they were a big problem, uh, going bad. So in 1968, like I say, I was a reservist here, so I'm, I'm a Cold War veteran. That's all there is to it. One of the big events in the Cold War was in 1968. We're talking about problems with North Korea, but in 1968, North Korea captured a, a Navy surveillance ship. Global. The Pueblo, yeah. And Captain Butcher and all his crew were taken prisoner, about a hundred of them. And that went on for quite a while. But as soon as that event happened, they started shipping a bunch of cargo and stuff, different things, and uh, I, got a, I got a call. That's the way the reserve works. They start calling up. You want to volunteer to go on a flight, and if you don't volunteer, then they call somebody else. There's always enough people to go. So I said, sure, I'll go, you know, just on a day's notice kind of thing. And so <clears throat> we came out, the crew met, and we flew up to McCord to pick up our, McCord is up by Tacoma, and uh, to pick up our cargo, and our cargo was just barbed wire. They were, it was going go to the DMZ to put up more barbed wire. So I had rolls and rolls and rolls of barbed wire. So I picked up the cargo, but just by chance at that time, there was a huge storm out in the Pacific, high winds. And at Travis, McCord, everything, it was all full of planes on the ground. No one, these type of planes, like I say, it took a while, even the 130s weren't getting through to the high headwinds. So we stayed overnight and we got up the next day and said, well, we'll give it a try. I mean, we didn't decide the command post did. So see how far, see if he can make it. So he put on the fuel and we flew out about seven hours. Like I say, normally it took 12 or so. We took out around seven hours and the winds were getting stronger. We weren't going to make it. So we turned around and came back. So we had about 14 hours local flying. Didn't get anywhere. So we get up the next day and the winds had died down a bit. So they put on even, capped off more fuel. We made it to Hawaii. So that's two days taking us now to get to Hawaii. So you always went to Hawaii. So we get up the next day, and uh, then you're rotating around where you fly at night most of the time, I guess. But anyhow, we were taken off at night out of Honolulu. And this plane had a very slow climb ratio. Like when we took off out of March over here on the runway, and if we were flying out to the north, you had to make a wide sweep to even clear the mountains around Running Springs or Lake Arrowhead, just to make that altitude. It was hard. Sometimes you'd have to make a circle. So we were taken off out of Honolulu, which is sea level, and they hadn't even just broke ground in Kapow, one of the engines blew up, you know, cylinder blew up. And uh, so, it, and we were fully loaded. And it just barely got off the ground and brought it back around. And I remember looking out in the boats in the harbor. 
but you the runway runs right along the harbor there. You look down, and it looked like the masts were right up by the plane. It was <laughs> close, but you know, I circled around, landed, it made it. And uh, so they always had, when they were flying these, they always had spare engines, of course. So we went into crew rest, and they changed the engine, and the next day we got on our way and made it to Wake Island. If you could make it to Wake Island, you had it made, because Wake Island wasn't a military base, per se. It was all contract labor from the Philippines. So all the mechanics were Filipinos, the people that ran the orders and everything, the cooks, great cooks, were all Filipinos. And uh, so then we get on. And to backtrack just a little how, how things go on when on these flights, the navigator on the flight, we were getting ready when we were down here at March to leave, and then the lead navigator was late. And like, we always fly with extra people, so you're not going to wait. So we were out almost ready to start the engines. The navigator showed up. He lived in Los Angeles, and he was driving out and in a hurry and got into a clover leaf down in L.A. and rolled his car. And he would, in that time, he managed to get back home, get another car, and get out and made the flight. So he was the same guy on Wake Island, and, and I'd never been there before either, so I had to get up and I slept the night to investigate the shore and everything, where, we, where I was, and he was out getting coral, and he rammed a big spike through his foot, but he, he still kept going, he never, never slowed up. So we get into Japan, and we land at Tachikawa, if any of you have ever flown into, this is an airport that was right in the city. It was closed back by 1970, but it was right there. And so you flew in and across the street, and the fence for the airport, and then you dropped down and landed. And there was all these Japanese communists that were on the other side of the street, and they would see how big of a bamboo, bamboo pole they could put up in the air to harass the crew, I guess. And they have a red flag on it. And I mean, they had some up there probably 40 or 50 feet in the air. And so there was all these flags flying, and she came in and landed. And uh, again, we happened to get there in the evening, so I spent the night, went out the next day, and uh, we were on takeoff roll. They had to abort it because of things weren't adding up to what it was supposed to be, and it called so they put us back in crew rest, worked on the plane all night. The next day, they had it ready to go, supposedly. And they were, they had in the meantime had taken the cargo off, so we never did fly into Korea. They put it on another plane to take it off there. So they, they ordered, which we never did, usually we flew back the same route, but this time, they weren't going to put anything on the plane and fill up full fuel and fly direct from Tokyo to Honolulu. And uh, so I was making out the paperwork, and I looked out the window, and the fire trucks were going by. By this time, I figured it must be us. <laughs> and they, they had called for fuel to fill it, and the guy went out and did it but they didn't cancel the order or something. And another guy saw the order, and he went out and filled it. And it burst the tanks on the plane, a couple of them. So there was fuel leaking all over the ground, and that's why the fire truck. So that canceled us out again. And while we were in the airport there, there was another 124 headed back to the States. And as reservists, our time was up. It, we were signed on for 10 days, 10 days were up. So we could get on a plane and fly home, let somebody else worry about it. So the crew decided, we'll fly on that 124 and get back to Honolulu. And so we got on it, they got about three hours out, and they lost an engine and had to go back to Japan. 
and uh, get back to Japan. So the next day, our plane was ready again, supposedly, and everything. So we get on it, and we had that direct route still to go to. And it was an all-nighter. We already left Japan in the afternoon. And we were coming into Honolulu at sunrise. It's just starting to get light. And about, and I was the only one awake. I was sitting up in the cockpit. Everybody else was sleeping. And I could see an airliner coming out of Honolulu at west. And he got even with us. And he just got on the radio and was radioing flight control back in Honolulu. He says, tell that C-124 he's on fire. <laughs> and had an engine on it. And uh, I, there was no indication in the instrument that, that I had, but the engineer was asleep. And remember I showed you on the thing, there's a little window and he can look out the side. So I got him awake and I said, look out there. And they don't have rear view mirrors in the plane, so you can't see too well what's behind you. And uh, sure enough, it, it wasn't on fire, it wasn't flames, but it was just boiling smoke. And oil lines had broken or something. And so we shut the engine down. I mean, it flew perfectly good. And so now we had another engine change back in Honolulu before we could get home. So it flies well on three. It even is supposed to fly on two. On the same side? Yeah. Hmm. It takes a little, but it, it will do it. I'm, that's what it says in the book. <laughs> See that big trim wheel? Yeah, you can trim it out of it. And, uh, but they, but could, they could change an engine just overnight? Yeah. When you start yeah, shutting out the door? Take about, yeah, about 15 hours or so they could do it. The last flights out of March here, and it was the, there was the last of the last. The last couple planes that went out, sent them out with cargo. They sent two planes. One plane had a couple of spare engines in it because there wasn't any in the system anymore. Everything was jets now. So the plane goes out and they have 20 mechanics on there and engines. So if they need to change on either plane, they got spare engines to go out. But, you know, I'm thinking, that, this is what, when you're flying an old plane with old engines and stuff, this is kind of, it was, it, the simulator was more calm sometimes rides than what you actually did, you know. But the simulator you go through, and that's what the instructors give you, all that, so you're prepared for it. Everything works out fine. So anyhow, yeah, that's just a little extra there. So I'm through unless anybody has any questions. Any questions? Well, nice well thank you. Uh, thank you.